We are in a series called Common Challenges, and uh, we've been talking about the stuff that everybody goes through at some point in your life. Uh, we all have blind spots. We talked about that. We, we all have moments when it feels like we're overlooked by others when there was an opportunity. Uh, we've all had moments when we are afraid. We've all been in places where we don't feel safe. And uh, these are very common challenges to all people. And uh, what's what the truth is, is that it's our response that can either be common or uncommon. And so today we're going to talk about unforgiveness. And what I can tell you is unforgiveness is a remarkably common experience. Sometimes it's an experience from another person who won't forgive us. Maybe we said or did something that frustrated or annoyed or hurt them, and so uh, we've asked for forgiveness, we've apologized, we've tried to make amends, and still the other person just holds unforgiveness over our heads. Or maybe your experience in unforgiveness is someone that you've not forgiven. Someone caused you pain, someone made you look foolish, uh, someone took something that you desired greatly, Maybe they made fun of some painful thing that you were going through. And we just bide our time. And we wait for the opportunity when that person is going to get theirs. Unforgiveness, very common. Forgiveness is what's uncommon. And I have to admit, walking into this talk, when you talk about unforgiveness because of how common it is, we get a little anxious about the conversation. And I have to confess something else to you. I don't know a topic that has been more poorly taught in the Christian faith than uh, forgiveness. Uh, we, we are told things like this. If you forgive, then you will forget. And then we feel like we haven't really forgiven because we still remember. How many still remember some of that stuff? Yeah. If, if, forget for, if, if forgiveness was the same as forgetfulness, all you'd have to do is hit someone in the head really hard until they didn't remember anymore. But the Bible says there's a difference between forgiveness and amnesia. They're not the same thing. So we're going to look at an incredible story this morning where someone operated in the power of forgiveness, and it's stunning. That this is the kind of story that just grips our hearts and our attention. And I wish I could have put all of the chapter in, because the whole chapter is the story this morning. But we've selected out the verses of Scripture that were most important to our conversation and that would fit on your notes. It says, So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 select Israelite troops to search there for David. David is not a missing person. He's being hunted like an animal. And these 3,000 select troops are because David himself is a mighty warrior. And he's cunning and he's crafty, and, and so King Saul needs his very best soldiers if he hopes to be able to kill David. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. And Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. This is bragging just a little bit. I only need one shot. He won't even make a noise. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, The Lord himself will strike him or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now, get the spear and the water jug that are near his head, and let's go. So David took the spear and the water jug near Saul's head, and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. How many wish God would do that for you sometimes, just to... Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away, and there was a wide space between them. And he called out to the army and to Abner, the son of Ner. So you wonder if his first name is Ab and his last name is Ner. <laughs> Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? And Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? And Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, yes, it is, my lord, the king. And he added, why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? 
What wrong am I guilty of? Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have become terribly wrong. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, David, my son. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. It's a powerful story. It's the second encounter that's very similar to this. You can read about the first one in the 24th chapter of 1 Samuel where David and his men were hiding in a cave and Saul went in there. He was unaware that David was there. and David could easily have struck and killed King Saul. But he didn't do it then and he doesn't do it in this story either. There's a prominent feature or prominent uh, thing that po is pointed out in this uh, story and that is Saul's spear. And this is a really important thing because this spear uh, would trigger a lot of emotions for David. Uh, on multiple occasions, King Saul had tried to kill David while he was singing and playing his harp. And King Saul would just rise up and grab his spear and hurl it with all of his might at David and, and say under his breath, I will pin you to the wall and I will kill you. And he didn't just stop there. David's very best friend, Jonathan, who's also King Saul's own son, there came a point when Jonathan stood up for David to his father and King Saul grabs that spear and tries to hurl it at his own son and take his life as well. You see an object like that and it'll push a lot of emotional buttons. Now Saul was sleeping and, and there was a strategy as to where he was sleeping and that was that they would put him in the middle of the camp and then they would put the, the soldiers as they slept around him. So it created a kind of a maze in, of, of military might in order to be able to get to the king. You would have to go through lots of soldiers to get to him. And so he's surrounded by all of them. And David sneaks into the camp. And he brings a guy with him whose name is Abishai. Abishai is actually his nephew. And he manages to get through this maze. And all he has to do when he gets there, that spear that Saul used against him and against his best friend is right there. All he has to do is pick it up. And with one blow, he ends the worst nightmare of his life. He's being hunted like an animal by 3,000 elite military troops. His family is no longer safe. Even priests that he went to see and they gave him bread from the altar, just like the communion that you took today. King Saul had ordered them to be killed and those priests were slain just because they gave David bread from off of the altar. He actually had to leave the country which made him susceptible to attack from enemies outside of Israel. All he has to do, one blow, and this entire nightmare is over. And not only that, he gets a lot of good stuff, too. He gets the throne that he's been promised. He gets command of the military. He gets servants. He gets a palace. All it takes, one blow. Everything is his. And he refuses to do it. So his nephew, who's with him, Abishai, he says, I'll do it. You don't have to get your hands dirty. In fact, he plays the God card. He says, God set this whole thing up. This is what answered prayer looks like. Give me one shot. That's all I need. Let me strike him. And David forbids it. And why is that? Because somehow David figured out a very powerful truth, and that is that the will of God can't be accomplished with unforgiveness. Unforgiveness will keep you out of the will of God. It's a horrible price to pay. Even in James, the, the apostle says this. He says that the anger of man does not produce the righteous life that God desires. Our resentment, our bitterness, our anger, our striking back does not make God's will to be released in our world. It's not how it works. So the question is, well, then why did David sneak into the camp if he wasn't intending to take Saul's life? 
And why did God actually seem to assist him by putting everybody into a deep sleep? And that is because he understood the power of forgiveness. God knew he could be trusted with this moment. And there's some important things that transpire in the story, and they all have significant meaning for us today. But it starts with this, and that is that you don't need permission to forgive someone. You don't need their permission. You can wait for them to ask for forgiveness, but if you do that, that leaves them in control. You can wait for them to apologize, but that leaves them in control. You can wait for them to try to make amends, but that leaves them in control. So the question I have is, why would you put a person who hurt you in control of your life? Why would you let them decide what's going to happen next? It's a really unwise thing to do. So you don't need permission, and you don't need to understand. See, if I could just understand why they did it, even David calls out and he says, what have I done that has deserved this kind of response? What sin have I committed against you? He doesn't understand. If you could understand, you wouldn't need to forgive. You would understand. And there is no rational explanation for this. Another thing is, you don't need to trust in order to forgive someone. And this is something that Christian people really struggle with. We think that if you forgive someone, that you have to instantly trust them. Let me explain something to you that will be helpful. Forgiveness is a gift. You know that because the word give is right in there. Forgive. Forgiveness. But trust is earned. Very different thing. And uh, even David, he shows us an example of this. So he, he talks to Saul when this event is over. He's, he's taking his spear and his water jug, and then he goes on a hill where there's a great distance away, and he hollers from there. And he says, you know, King Saul, I have your spear. And, uh, and, and King Saul says, uh, why don't you bring it down here? Uh, I forgive you. Uh, I won't hurt you. I'm sorry for what I've done. And David says, why don't you send up a young man to get the spear? Why does he do that? Because he does not trust King Saul. And here's what's strange, is King Saul can actually mean it when he says it. We think people are lying to us. Often they're not lying. They're just in more control at that moment. And then when David is standing there, all his fears rise to the surface again, and he acts out of his vengeance and his fear. And David doesn't trust him. You don't have to trust in order to forgive. You don't have to reconcile in order to forgive. Reconciliation requires both sides to work at something, and that doesn't always happen. But you can forgive even if the relationship is not reconciled. Another thing, you don't have to pretend in order to forgive. Uh, it's fascinating. When you read through this chapter twice, David refers to King Saul as anointed three times as Lord, six times as king. Is, is he, what is he doing? Is he pretending? No, that's who Saul is. This is a very frustrating thing to us as we try to follow God. We assume that the people who are in leadership are always perfect, and they're not. And then we're very devastated when their imperfections surface. And this is what David is saying. He's saying he is God's anointed, and he is the king, and he is my Lord, and he is corrupt, and he is vengeful, and he has a murderous spirit. All of those things are true. You don't have to pretend. And in Christianity, a lot of times we pretend and call it faith. And faith is not pretending at all. They're not the same thing. So... Um, he, he, doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't have to uh, uh, pretend. Uh, this is what forgiveness is. If this is what forgiveness is not, or what you don't have to do, then what does forgiveness look like? And this is the essential element of forgiveness, and that is, I will not hurt you back. That's basically what forgiveness is. I will not hurt you back. Uh, if anyone has ever hurt you and, and you've had the opportunity to, to say something about them so that other people will be aware how incredibly bad this individual is, 
and you just say that, you know, in a way you're hurting them back. I, I have a, a, a person in our church family who they're moving to another location and they, they asked if, if I would do a little research on the location they're going to to help them find a good church so that they would be able to attend while they're there. I said, I'd be happy to do that. And I was doing research and, and, and I don't know if you know this, but there are actually ratings for churches on social media just like there are for restaurants. And so I'm, I'm going through, and a, and a five-star church, wow, that's good. By the way, I didn't check to see what ours uh, was, you know, but five, oh, that's, that's good. But then I saw this church, one star, one star. I said, man, that has got to be bad. And so I, I looked at the review, and this is what the review said. This church is more like a cult than a church, and the leader of this church is guilty of incredible sin, and this is what he's done. And it lists the sins. And I thought to myself, he's trying to hurt him back. That leader did something to him. There was some exchange that caused that person pain. And now he's going to hurt him back. Uh, you don't try to thwart an opportunity that something good might happen in their life. You don't wait for something bad to happen and then secretly rejoice or maybe not so secretly rejoice. You don't feel better when they feel worse. I will not hurt you back. That's what the commitment of forgiveness is. I will not hurt you back. Now, that sounds like it might be a little bit easier, but it's still challenging. There's another thing that happens. In addition to the commitment, I will not hurt you back, there's this commitment that I will try to wake you up. Jonathan could have just left Nothing but his footprints in the dirt around the head of King Saul. He, he didn't have to say anything. He could have just left a note. David was here. <laughs> that would have been enough. But he doesn't do that. He goes to a safe distance, and then he calls to wake Saul up. He calls out. And this is what he tells Saul. I had the opportunity to harm you. I didn't take it. I could have ended this horrific nightmare in my life. I chose not to exercise that option because it's not in my heart to do that to you. He's telling them, you don't have to surrender to this kind of vengeance that turns you into a murderer and a terrorist. I am not here to hurt you. There's a better life available for you. He's trying to wake Saul up. You don't, and this is what forgiveness does. It doesn't just say they get what they deserve. I'm not going to add anything to their pain, but let them go. That's not real forgiveness. Real forgiveness will say, I'm not going to add anything to their pain, and if I have opportunity, I will try to wake them up. And this is how you wake them up. You remind them of two things. I will not hurt you. It's not in my heart. And I think God has better things for you than going and hurting others. You remind them of those two things. It helps to waken them. They don't all wake up. I can tell you that. Some people are very deep sleepers when it comes to unforgiveness and vengeance. The last thing about uh, forgiveness is probably the hardest to explain. And it is, I will pay the pain debt. I will pay the pain debt. Um, so if someone has hurt you, it just hurts. Maybe they violated a promise. Maybe they took advantage of you in some way. And every time you think about that situation, it causes you anxiety. It causes you pain. It causes you grief. It causes you sorrow. These are all very powerful emotions. And it's difficult for us to navigate them. And uh, so when you, when you have an opportunity to say something about someone and you don't say it, you will feel pain. So you, you, you're talking with some friends and that person comes up and you, you have the opportunity to say, you know, well, you know, they're not what you think they are. And then you can share your little story so they will be enlightened about how bad that person is. And, and you don't exercise that option. It will hurt. Every time you don't respond in a way that will cause them pain, you will feel pain. And this is what I want you to know. That's you paying the pain debt. And when you pay the pain debt, eventually the pain debt gets paid in full. And now you're able to refer to and recall and remember what it is they did to you 
with clarity. You've not forgotten the details, but without the pain. If we keep taking our shots at people and trying to undermine them and overrule them and, 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 and do everything we can to destroy them, if we keep doing that, the pain debt does not get paid. We're just adding to it. And by the way, humans are bad at this anyway. They've actually done studies. They've taken people and they've, they've, they've uh, outfitted them with pressure pads on their fingers and with pressure pads on their chest, and they tell person one, poke person two and they poke them. And then they tell person to, now poke the other person back with the same pressure they poked you with. And in all situations, they poke harder. It's what we do. It's part of the sinful human condition. And so we have the opportunity to not poke back, and we will feel the pain, but we're paying an installment on that pain debt and over time, you will notice the pain subsides and goes away. If you don't do that, the pain that they caused you never goes away. In fact, it might even fester and get even worse and control even more of your life. Now, where does this power to forgive come from? How can we find power to not hurt someone back? How can we find power uh, to, to, to absorb the pain and, and make the the pain debt installments so that we can get back to health and wholeness. How, how does this happen? And the answer is the power to forgive comes from love. Th that is what motivates us and empowers us to actually forgive. But in the Western world, our concept of what love is is, is more about romance than it is about love. And in our culture, love is usually defined either as an affection for or attraction to. And uh, how many here have ever heard of someone and they said, it was love at first sight. It was attraction at first sight. And don't get me wrong, they might have been very attractive. And you may have decided in that moment, that's who I want in my life for the rest of my life. And, and I'm not saying that that is a bad thing, but that's not the true definition of love. Love is a commitment to want what is best for that person, no matter what. Even if, it, well, let's put it this way. If you've been married for very long, you've already experienced some days when you were less affectionate towards and attracted to. People can just annoy you. They can do stuff that drives you nuts. And then you just you kind of storm around the house. And, you, and, and people will even say this, I guess I've fallen out of love. No, you didn't fall out of love. You're just ticked off at them right now. And those emotions will ebb and flow. They go up and down. But a commitment to want what's best for someone else no matter what, that's what love basically is. It's saying, I want your life to be healthy. I want your relationships to be life-giving. I want your potential to be realized. And I was always acting in ways towards you that will help make that happen. So that sounds really hard, and it is. It's very hard. And we don't see a lot of examples of it, but we do have one great one. Jesus was greater than David. And he paid the pain debt for all of us. He absorbed all the pain from all of our sin and all of our mistakes and all of our rebellion and all of our misdeed. And they rained blows upon him. And he just didn't borrow a spear. A spear. He took the end of it in his side. The blow went against him. And in that moment... He could have said, that's it. That's enough. I will not tolerate this anymore. I have not done anything to deserve this. And he could have unleashed unbelievable divine wrath and incinerated everyone in his presence. He could have called for a legion of angels to rescue him from the cross and nurse him back to health. And he didn't do any of those things. He absorbed every single ounce of the pain. Why? Because he loves us. He wants what's best for us. Always. He never fades. He never wanes. On 
wanting what is best for you in your life. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you have ever done that will make God want less than his best for your life because he loves us with a completely pure and incorrupt, undying, never-ending, always available for us love. Aren't you grateful we have a God who loves us like that? How is he able to forgive us? Because he loves us. And here's what's fascinating. David would eventually become the king. The nightmare would be over, and all the things he desired would be given to him. And he would be reminded Saul was never in control of his life. David never had to raise his hand. He just needed to know how to forgive. Because when you know how to forgive, God's will is released in your life. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, we're not good at this. Emotions of frustration, bitterness, rage. They control so many of our actions. Would you help us? Would you help us learn that we don't have to strike others back? We don't have to cause hurt. That doesn't mean we pretend. It doesn't mean that we put ourselves in unsafe situations. It just simply means that we can walk in wisdom and forgive at the same time. It's not only possible, it's what you call us to. And for some of us today, that would be a truly uncommon experience. Would you help us lean into that truth and walk in it today? In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?